know it's amazing what becomes clearer when we put the Jewishness that was removed out of the Bible, kind of like it was an inflamed appendix, um, and we put it back into the Bible. And a prime example of why ignoring the Jewish nature of the Bible is so problematic is the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. The traditional Western Roman Church's answer to who is Melchizedek is that it's Jesus. Much like the way the church also suggests that pretty much any time a human attribute is ascribed to God, like when God was walking in the Garden of Eden during the time of Adam, well, it must have been Jesus. Now, I don't want to get too far into that, and I also don't want to sound at all dogmatic about my views, because this side of heaven, there's so much mystery involved with such matters for sure that I don't want to try to write it in concrete. But I must admit, I'm not convinced by the Christian tradition on this kind of issue. Long time ago, the great Hebrew scholar Maimonides, also known by the Jews as the Rambam, stated what is obvious if one will simply read the scriptures with an open mind. The entire human-like descriptions of God's thoughts and his actions are figurative, not literal. Yehovah doesn't jump with joy. He has no physical legs. He doesn't swing a glittering sword over his head because he has no physical hand or arm and he has not fashioned a sword. He doesn't come down to earth to see what's happening and then travel back up to heaven to ponder it because he's omnipresent. God doesn't have emotions the way we think of them. He doesn't get angry and then later become sad. He isn't happy one moment and then he's unhappy the next moment. Words, as we think of words and communication as we think of communication, are strictly the products of the physical and material world. The reason for these figurative words is because there's simply no other way for us to communicate about it. There's no spirit words that exist for a human to speak or to communicate to another human being, at least on a physical, human level. Everything that we use to describe the attributes of God are insultingly inadequate. And they're always based on human behaviors on human characteristics, but we have to use something. The same goes for ascribing the figurative statements about God to Yeshua just because at a momentous time in the history of the world, some essence of the Supreme Spirit being called Yehovah was made into flesh and blood and then placed on planet Earth. If Yeshua was Every human form that was convenient for us to use for some purpose in any and every era, then the fact that Messiah, Yeshua, had to come from the line of David and he had to be born of a virgin virgin, takes on an awfully watered-down meaning. As concerns the errant belief that Christ and Melchizedek were actually one and the same. The rather lengthy homily in Hebrews would have been a perfect place to explain that the parallels drawn between the two were because they were the same guy. But we don't find any such thing. I mean, consider this. The Shekinah was a physical manifestation of sorts because it sometimes came in the form of a visible cloud or a pillar of fire. Remember that? Are we to assume that Shekinah was Jesus because it had a physical property to it? What about those other times 
those other visible manifestations that the Bible calls the angel of the Lord. Yet when that term is used, the angel of the Lord is never a messenger, certainly not a go-between, which is the typical occupation of an angel, but rather he seems to be the very presence of God with full power and divine authority and refers to himself as God. So is the angel of the Lord, also Jesus. How about that visible finger of God that wrote the stone tablets for Moses and said his name was Jehovah? Was that not quite the truth? Was it actually Yeshua's finger? How about the burning bush on Mount Sinai? That was tangible and real. So was the burning bush Yeshua too? I think you get my point. We should not, in my opinion, run around describing the name and person of Yeshua to every divine manifestation that seems to have human or even simply material characteristics ascribed to it. Jesus, Yeshua, was the name given to a specific man born at a precise time in history in a precise set of circumstances for a precise purpose, to be Savior. That this man... Jesus of Nazareth is also the Son of God and is God and is Messiah is solid biblical truth. However, there are no scriptural words or thoughts that Jesus came and appeared at some number of other earlier times in a myriad of forms. This seems to me to just be a somewhat pained defense of a long-held Christian tradition that tends to oversimplify complex and infinite spiritual realities that go well beyond our human capabilities to comprehend, and does so in a way that kind of packages these things nice and neatly and cleanly so there can be no gray areas. In fact, the scriptures emphatically state that the future Messiah will come for a second time in of itself, that completely refutes the notion that he appeared several other times in the past. In order to come a second time, he had to have been here once before, not lots of other times. Now, in our last lesson, I mentioned that some Jewish sages think that Melchizedek was Shem, son of Noah. So without my necessarily advocating, that Shem was Melchizedek, Shem certainly would make a lot of sense. And on the whole, it's a lot better guess than Yeshua. First, Shem was still alive. Do you know that Shem outlived Abraham? Second, the land of Canaan, which is where Shalem was located, a city, was a very pagan place. And yet, in the midst of nearly universal heathenism, here is a man who speaks of the God Most High, the God that even Abraham was just beginning to get to know. And Melchizedek seems to speak with, with a deep understanding of this one true God, yet never does he make himself to be God. <clears throat> In fact, he is called the priest of El Elyon long before there was such a thing as a Levitical priesthood. Third of all, Abraham seemed to know who this man was and he had the deepest reverence for him. In fact, Melchizedek's presence didn't seem to surprise anyone. It just seems matter of fact, expected. Without any explanation at all, Abraham gives one-tenth of all the recovered property to this man, Melchizedek, indicating that to do so was just some kind of an understood protocol. And by the way, be careful not to attach the tithing label, as we think of it today in churches. This tenth that was given was a standard payment due for kings in that day for spoils of war. This is a one-time payment, it's not some ongoing obligation. 
So let's bring some other scriptural mention of Melchizedek into play. Follow that line of inquiry. The next mention of Melchizedek after Genesis is in Psalm 110, which is accepted by Jew and Christian alike as prophetic, um, as a messianic psalm. So if you've got it handy, open your Bible to Psalm 110. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 905. <clears throat> 905. Psalm 110. We're going to read four verses, starting with verse 1. Adonai says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Adonai will send you a powerful scepter, send you as a powerful scepter out from Zion so that you will rule over your enemies around you. On the day your forces mobilize, your people willingly offer themselves in holy splendors from the womb of the dawn. The dew of your youth is yours. Adonai has sworn it. He will never retract it. You are a priest forever to be compared with Melchizedek. Here in an Old Testament scripture, we see this reference to the future Messiah as being in the order of, or in some versions, compared to Melchizedek. What does that mean? Well, the word, the word translated order of is in Hebrew, Debra, Debra. And it has the sense of meaning of in the manner of or similar in intent. So the Messiah being in the manner of Melchizedek means that Messiah would be a high priest and a king, just as was Melchizedek, something that was rare, but not unheard of in Bible times. But it also likely meant there was some genealogical connection. So we have the original story of Melchizedek in Genesis 14. It's followed up in Psalms 900 years later. And then in the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 7, 1900 years later, we find more of Melchizedek's attributes are brought out, and they all connect. Here's the thing. The order of, or the manner of, of Melchizedek is all about a special priestly system that will be higher than the Levite priesthood because this priest is also going to be a king. As of the time of this story, Abraham's day, there was no Levite priesthood. There weren't even any Levites yet. The Levite clan wouldn't exist for 200 more years. Then, at least 400 years after that 200 years, the Levite priesthood would finally begin with Aharon, Aaron, brother of Moses, becoming the first high priest. No earthly priest was to be higher than the high priest of Israel. It was the high priest alone that could enter the Holy of Holies in the temple, and only once per year, to meet God. But the priesthood that Melchizedek represented was of a different type than the Levitical high priesthood. It was representative of the type of priesthood that Messiah himself would have before God. It would be perpetual, and it would include kingship. So, what can we say in conclusion about Melchizedek? He was a real man. He was a high priest, and he was the king of the city of Shalem that possibly eventually came to be called Jerusalem. He was a type of Christ, but he was not the Christ. He was a shadow of the Messiah to come, very possibly. He was Shem, son of Noah. Well, now let's take a look at the last part of Genesis chapter 14. So go way to the front of your Bibles to Genesis chapter 14. 
you have a complete Jewish Bible, we're going to start on page uh, 13. And we'll read from uh, verse 17 of chapter 14 on to the end. <clears throat> After his return from slaughtering Kedorla Omer and the kings with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the Shave Valley, also known as the King's Valley. Melchizedek, king of Shalem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of El Elyon, so he blessed him with these words. Blessed be Avram by El Elyon, maker of heaven and of earth, heaven of heaven and earth. And blessed be El Elyon, who handed your enemies over to you. Avram gave him a tenth of everything. And the king of Sodom said to Avram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Avram answered the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand in an oath to Adonai El Elyon, maker of heaven and earth that I will not take so much as a thread or a sandal thong of anything that's yours, so that you won't be able to say, I made Avram rich. I will take only what my troops have eaten and the share of the spoil belonging to the men who came with me, uh, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. Well, Melchizedek, is either delusional or he actually bears great authority and understands just who God is because he pronounces that Abraham is blessed by El Elyon and that El Elyon is to be blessed. Abraham offers utterly no response that was written down as he seems to know to whom he's submitting. And Abraham gives Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Now the king, or the ruler of Sodom, says to Abraham, you know what? Give me the people. You keep the loot. Why would he say that? Well, first, the king of Sodom had authority over the recovered loot. It was his to keep it or give it away. Yet it's obvious that in some way or another, Melchizedek had even greater authority than this king because part of that 10% that Abraham gave to Melchizedek consisted of things that belonged to the king of Sodom. And you know what? That king didn't, didn't resist, didn't protest one whit. Now understand that the king of Sodom was the king over perhaps the most wicked city in all of Canaan. Not the world, maybe. This guy was evil. And he was under the control of evil. The king of Sodom is a type of Satan, maybe of an antichrist. Just as Melchizedek was righteous under the control of righteousness, a type of Christ. This scene is reminiscent to me of Yeshua's encounter with Satan. When Satan said to him, just bow down to me. I have the authority to give you incomparable material wealth. Just as Abraham never challenged the king of Sodom's authority and possession of all this recovered wealth, neither does Jesus challenge Satan's authority over the material wealth of the world. Neither Abraham nor Yeshua say, ah, oh, it's not yours to give. In fact, it was the prince of evils to give. Notice also that Satan was eager to give away as much wealth as it took to get Yeshua to, in essence, not redeem humanity and instead allow the devil to have the people. This is parallel to the king of Sodom saying to Abraham, look, Keep all the wealth for yourself. Just give me the people you saved. We've talked a lot about God principles. Well, here's a Satan principle. Does Satan want your wealth? Or does he want you? Satan could care less about material possessions. 
He wants to own your soul. That's what he's after. In the end, the battle between Satan and Jehovah God is over people, not over things. Anyway, Abraham rebuffs the king, understanding whom he's dealing with, and he tells him, no, thank you. Besides, says Abraham, I don't want you, as a representative of the evil one, to ever be able to say that my abundance has anything to do with you. Whatever I have, whether it's a little or a lot, comes from God. And I don't want whatever it is that you can even offer me. It's a wise lesson for all of us. The most important characteristic of anything is not what it is. It's the source that it comes from. Now, let's get back to our Bibles and read Genesis chapter 15. Again, we're going to start on page 13. We're going to read the whole chapter. Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. Sometime later, the word of Adonai came to Avram in a vision. Don't be afraid, Avram. I'm your protector. Your reward will be very great. And Avram replied, Adonai, God, God what good will your gifts be to me if I continue childless? And Eliezer from Damasek, Damascus, inherits my possessions. You haven't given me a child, Avram continued. So someone born in my house will be my heir. But the word from Adonai came to him, this man will not be your heir. No, your heir will be a child from your own body. Then he brought him outside and said, look up at the sky. Count the stars, if you can count them. Your descendants will be that many. And he believed in Adonai. And he credited it to him as righteousness. And then he said to him, I'm Adonai, who brought you out from ur Kasdim to give you this land as your possession. And he replied, Adonai God, how am I to know that I'll possess it? And he answered him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all of these. He cut the animals in two. He placed the pieces opposite each other, but he didn't cut the birds in half. Birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses. Abraham drove them away. Now, as the sun was about to set, a deep sleep fell on Avram. Horror and great darkness came over him. And Adonai said to Avram, Know this for certain. Your descendants will be foreigners in a land that's not theirs. They'll be slaves. They will be held in oppression there for 400 years. But I will judge that nation, the one that makes them slaves, and afterwards they will leave with many possessions. Now as for you, you will join your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. Only in the fourth generation will your descendants come back here, because only then will the Amorites be ripe for punishment. And after the sun had set and there was a thick darkness, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared, which passed between these animal parts. That day, Adonai made a covenant with Avram. I have given this land to your descendants, from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the territory of the Cani, the Kinesi, the Kadmoni, the Hitti, the Parisi, the Rephaim, the Amori, the Canani, the Girgashi, and the Yavusi. You know how true it is that after we've visited that victorious mountaintop, we can easily slide down into the valley of despair below. Abraham, sometime after this great victory of Kedorla Omer, was allowing all of his fears to, to surface and he was entertaining them. Abraham was in wicked Canaan. He was outnumbered thousands to one, realizing that even though he had a substantial and a growing family, that it was 
the result primarily of the births coming from his female slaves. Plus, his hold on the land was, was tenuous at best. Besides, how was Abraham going to have all these descendants to inherit the land that God promised if he didn't even have children? Abraham wonders in verse 2 of his purchased servant, Eleazar, whom we're told is from Damascus, is going to wind up as the sole inheritor when, when Abraham dies. Well, verse 1 begins with the words, sometime later. So we don't know how long it was after the battle with the kings from Mesopotamia and the rescue of Lot and that this episode of chapter 15 takes place. However, it would appear that it's not too long at all. Fear not. God says to Avram, fear? What exactly was this fear that Abraham was experiencing? Had he not just finished flexing his muscles and defeating those northern armies? It was the fear that those kings would come back to take retribution because of Abraham smiting them. After all, it was only it was, not, it was not only a very shameful defeat for these powerful kings of the north, but the guy who beat them wasn't even harmed from what they had done. They had not come to make war with Abraham. They had done nothing to Abraham except to unknowingly capture a relative who lived far away from his uncle. Now God, knowing Abraham's fears, goes on to explain that he'll protect him and even reward Avram. Reward. Reward Avram for what? For refusing to be enriched by the evil king of Sodom. For choosing to put his faith in Melchizedek's God. Avram apparently was rethinking his idealistic and principled refusal to accept all of this booty that had been liberated from Cardola Omer and had been returned to the king of Sodom, except for that 10% that had been given to Melchizedek. Avram would have been instantly an even wealthier man if he simply had accepted the ruler of Sodom's most gracious, generous offer. But this worry war continues to wring his hands, and in a revealing and unflattering, by the way, dialogue, Abraham starts pouring out his fears, his suspicions, his, his anxieties to Jehovah. He doesn't even easily accept God's promises to him. Now, we, you and me, we wouldn't ever do that, would we? Nah, not us. God says, I'm going to do thus and so for you. And how often do you respond? Well, okay, God, but how exactly are you going to do that? I mean, how are you going to do it? And when are you going to do it? Sure doesn't look like it's happening. There's no evidence that it ever will happen. Yes, Avram was God's man, but he was still just a man. So after being assured that God will protect him from these bad boys from the north, and then further be assured that his prosperity will be increased even more, God promises Abraham the thing he's most worried about, an heir, a son. Now, In all fairness, we of the modern Western world just can't grasp the importance of a son as an heir to a man in that era. It wasn't merely a matter of passing on wealth in land holdings. To Avram and to virtually all humans of the known civilizations of that time, the belief was that a man lived on through his heir. It was not so much a reincarnation as that the ethereal substance that was invisible, unknowable, that which makes each person a unique individual, the life force, which contained the bloodlines of that family, 
was carried forward through human reproduction. In some mysterious, undefined way, the fundamental nature of the father would live on through his son. For a man to die without a male heir meant an end to his family line, therefore an end to his own personal afterlife essence. For a woman to be unable to give a son to her husband, well, this was about the most shameful thing for her. Her primary reason for existence as a human female was to produce a male heir for that husband of hers. To fail was tantamount to becoming useless. For people of Abraham's day, there was no concept of dying and going to heaven and living with God for eternity. A son, then, was Abraham's only hope of seeing all of God's promises realized. That's it. So Jehovah tells Abraham, oh yes, you will be a father. So the foreigner Eliezer will not have to become the inheritor of the family wealth. Now Abraham is encouraged when he tells when God tells him to look up into the night sky, count the stars, because that's how, many, how numerous his descendants are going to be. And then in verse 6, we're told something that so many modern believers are so certain was only a promise that came in the New Testament, one that was brought by Jesus. He, Abraham, believed God, and God credited it to him as righteousness. Here was the essence of God's plan of salvation. Trust in God, and in return, God will credit the worshiper as achieving righteousness. There is no better meaning for the term grace than that. Grace was Adam's hope. Grace was Noah's hope. Grace was Abraham's hope. Grace was the foundational principle of the Torah as given to Moses. It's the foundational principle of the new covenant in Yeshua. Grace is our hope today. It's never changed. Now that, now that that matter of, of Abraham's heir has been addressed, at least Abraham thinks it has, God brings up another matter, the matter of the promised land. He brings it up in verse 7 and he says, look, Avram, I brought you from Ur, up in Mesopotamia, to this place, to give this place to you. In other words, don't you get it? What do you think this whole thing's been about? You're going to get the land. Nothing can prevent it because I've already decided it. It's done. And then Abraham asks in verse 8 a curious question that smacks of the, the highest skepticism, skepticism, if not downright distrust. Well, how am I no, to know that I'll possess the land? Ooh. Now, I say curious because God had at an earlier time already promised this land to Abraham. Did Abraham not believe Jehovah? Did he not get it? The fact is, Abraham's faith was wavering a little bit. I mean, how many times do we in our spirits, we, we know God has spoken to us. We know this. But time goes by. There's no more visible, tangible confirmation of the subject of that conversation, so we begin to wonder if our imagination was working over time. Or did God really speak to me? I think we've all been there, one time or another, and I suspect we will be again. But let's get practical. The fact is that by all custom and traditions of humans in Abraham's era, Promises that were real had structure. That shouldn't be surprising to us. Our promises today also have structure. Usually it's in the form of a contract. In our society, 
there is precious little we will accept as legitimate or trustworthy offer from another person unless it's put to paper and it's made to fit the laws of our civil code and then it's signed by all involved parties. That's just how we do it. Nobody questions why do we do it that way. It was the same in Abraham's day. There was a customary procedure to follow when a promise was made. And that procedure had not yet been carried out in God's promise to Avram. Now, we may not consciously realize it, but we all expect to deal with God on our cultural terms. I promise you, you think that way whether you know it or not. What good is it to give Americans a proof or a word in a form that only a Japanese person would up understand within their culture for what it is? It would mean nothing to us. Same thing goes in reverse. A person living over in the Sudan is going to need a proof or a word from God that he understands. Something that's normal and customary in his Sudanese society. Not something that's nor normal and ordinary for an American. Avram was waiting for the promise of God to be put into a customary Middle Eastern structure that he can then recognize it for what it was. God's merciful. So what happens next is that a visible form of covenant-making procedure done with all the cultural norms for that time is performed for Abraham. I say visible because Abraham could see it with his own eyes. And it was socially recognizable for what was going on. I say visible because when God speaks and makes a, prominent, a promise, it's already a covenant, far superior than anything that can be written down or sealed by some ritual. The fabric of space and time is altered when God makes a covenant. The entire universe is reshaped. It's focused on that covenant. This is not allegory. I'm not try to say anything poetic. This is the absolute reality of the situation. There doesn't have to be a humanly devised procedure performed in order for God's promise to become a legal covenant. Yehovah performed this only to give Abraham peace of mind. So God in his graciousness lowered himself and he performed the standard human covenant ritual as a sign to Abraham of the validity of those promises of land and blessing and also of a son and many descendants. Well, in verses 9 and 10, we see a typical covenant ceremony performed. And it revolves around the use of animals as agents for the promise. Now, these animals, clean animals, are killed. They're cut up into pieces. They're separated into two groups. Now remember the Hebrew word for covenant is berit, which means to, to cut and, and to divide. Now I want to be careful in my terminology here. And I'd like you to notice that this covenant ceremony was not a sacrifice. There's no sacrifice going on here. The animals weren't sacrificed in the strictest sense of the word. There was no altar. There was no burning up of the animals. This was not a presentation of a gift. It wasn't, wasn't the seeking of acceptance. It wasn't a plea for atonement to God by Abraham. Rather, this is God's gift to humanity. This is God raising his right hand and swearing upon himself to be true to his oath. This is a 100% God action. Abraham was just the recipient of a promise. God promises a national identity to a people who don't even yet exist. A people who at first would be called Hebrews and then eventually Israelites. Ancient records of various Middle and Far Eastern peoples are full of covenant ceremonies essentially just like the one we're witnessing in this passage. But nowhere ever 
is there a record or even a tradition of a God promising a land and a title deed that is irrevocable as long as time exists? Suddenly, however, in verse 11, birds of prey appear. They try to escape with the carcasses of, of these dead animals. Abraham drives them away. I mean, what's, what is the meaning of these few words about these birds of prey? See, birds of prey, really we're talking about vultures, scavenger birds, are symbolic of death and of evil. This was Satan trying to disrupt and stop the covenant because he knew what this was going to lead to. You know, how often we are warned in the scriptures that when God promises, promises us good things, Satan is going to come. He's going to try to steal it away. And whether it is to steal the thing itself or to steal our faith and our trust in God's promise or to take away our peace, the way to take away our shalom, Satan wants you to have what he has to offer you, not what God's already given you. And as those birds swoop down, Abraham could have simply sat there and thought, well, easy come, easy go not fought the evil. Or more in tune with modern Christian attitude, Abraham could have been completely passive, deciding, well, God wants the promise to go forth. He's going to have to battle that vulture, not me. No, we are Jehovah's warriors on earth. We're going to have to get our hands dirty. We're going to have to put ourselves at risk. See, prayer is the key. It doesn't replace action. Prayer prepares us for action. Avram driving those birds away is the Torah equivalent to James' famous New Testament saying, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. God now recites an oath, always central to the covenant making protocol. But before he does, it says, a deep sleep comes over Abraham. This does not mean that Abraham fell asleep because he got tired. This whole thing was going on too long. We see several Old Testament and New Testament equivalents to this when it speaks of visions within dreams or, or being taken up in the spirit. Even more, it says a great sense of dread overcame Abraham in his sleep. It was a dark dread, the Bible says. Let's turn to our Hebrew for a moment. The word used here in Hebrew for dark dread is ha shecha. Ha shecha. Now this word ought to sound a little familiar to us. Its root word is choshech. And choshech simply means darkness. But as we learned back in Genesis 1, this doesn't mean darkness like nighttime or when somebody turns out the lights. It's a spiritual term. It means dread, evil, death, blindness. So, ha shecha is a negative term and it indicates a connection with the spirit world. And what follows helps us to understand the disturbing nature of what Abraham saw because Jehovah says, what Jehovah says in verse 13 scares the wits out of him. God tells him that Abraham's descendants are going to become slaves in a foreign land. And they're going to be oppressed and they're going to be in that land for four centuries. And that word oppressed is not a throw-in word. See, slaves to Abraham were simply purchased family members. Abraham didn't oppress his slaves. But Abraham's offspring were going to be subjugated and they were going to be treated very badly. And it was not going to be here in Canaan where they'd be enslaved. Jehovah says it will be in a land not their own. Then God says he will punish that foreign land and its people and in consequence Abraham's descendants will be released and they'll leave with a great amount of wealth. 
course, with the benefit of hindsight at this point, we now know that Egypt would be that foreign place and that a succession of pharaohs will be their oppressors. We even know that indeed the Israelites did leave with much of Egypt's wealth. Jehovah also tells Abraham he will live to a ripe old age and that his clan is soon going to leave this place but won't return until the fourth generation from Abraham. I think we'll stop here and we'll pick back up next time.